The scripture text for this edition of Dr. Barnhouse and the Bible, Romans chapter 10, we're looking at verses 9 and 10. Here again is Dr. Donald Gray Barnhouse with a message entitled, Complete Salvation. Through the Lord Jesus Christ we come unto thee, our Father and our God, and in the Holy Spirit. We pray thee that thou wilt guide us as the word goes forth. We ask it in the name and for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. We are studying in the book of Romans in chapter 10 and 9 and 10. The great text is, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We're dealing with that part of the text which says, Thou shalt be saved. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. The Greek word for salvation, soteria, which has been translated for us as salvation, was a word that was known both to the Jews and the pagans. The early Christians, who were all Jews, knew the word as it was used in their Septuagint translation of the Old Testament scriptures. The pagans knew the word as it was used in their mystery religions. Paul used it, of course, because it was the word which was already in the scriptures and which the Holy Spirit was giving to him to express all that God wants us to know of his divine plans for us, his hopes, his desires, his longings for us on whom he has so richly set his love. But as Sir William Ramsey has pointed out, to the pagans the word carried meaning and power not because it was in the Septuagint, but because it expressed the desire of their hearts and was familiar to them in their own religious observances. To the pagans, salvation was safety, health, and prosperity. But even in pagan usage, there was an undertone that carried a meaning that was beyond the present. It was not merely present safety, present health, and present prosperity but a desire for future safety, health, and prosperity that went beyond the grave. Ramsey even says, There is latent in the word some undefined and hardly conscious thought of the spiritual and the moral, which made it suit Paul's purpose admirably. Even as today, unsaved men have a craving and a longing for true life after death. In the Rome of Paul's day, the same ideas clung around their word which translated this Greek word into Latin. Now, confining ourselves to the biblical Christian use of the word, we discover that several phases of the ancient ideas are incorporated in the New Testament word. There is the idea of deliverance, first on the low level of deliverance from bodily ills. It is in this sense that we find the word in the book of the Acts, where Paul healed the impotent man. He arrived in Lystra, it is recorded in the 14th chapter of Acts, and almost immediately performed a miracle so noteworthy that the people of the community mistook him and his companion Barnabas for gods. Ramsey has translated the pertinent verses as follows. They fled from Iconium into Lyconia, with its cities Lystra and Derbe, and the region around the cities, and there they engaged in preaching the good news. And at Lystra, a certain man, impotent in the feet, was sitting, a man lame from his birth, one who had never walked. This man was listening to Paul preaching, and Paul, gazing fixedly on him as if reading his very soul, and seeing that he had the faith to be saved, called loudly to him, Stand on thy feet upright. Now both the King James Version and all modern translations render this verb saved in its purely pagan sense healed. Ramsey has translated the verb as saved in order to show the bridge between pagan thinking about this word and the full Christian use of it. He asks, what was the salvation which the lame man at Lystra was capable of receiving? And shows that the word in this place has hardly the Christian sense, but is used practically in the common pagan sense. The King James Version says that Paul saw that he had faith to be healed. The American revision says that Paul saw that he had faith to be made whole. 
And the newer revised standard version goes back towards the King James, saying that Paul saw that he had faith to be made well. Now from such a simple and narrow meaning, the word is used in a larger spiritual and ethical sense. And thus we find Peter saying that the long suffering of the Lord is salvation. Also we find the Lord Jesus speaking to Zacchaeus, saying salvation is come to this house meaning that that which leads to the soul's safety and salvation had come to the house. In a technical biblical sense, this salvation was the messianic salvation, which had been announced throughout the Old Testament and which had come to pass in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, first of all, this messianic salvation, biblical salvation, was something that was accomplished by Christ and which became available to the whole of the human race. We find this thought in such verses as that in which Christ made his pronouncement to the woman at the well. Woman, you worship you know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. This was the declaration that, that all that he was, and that all that he was going to accomplish, would be in accordance with the prophecies made in the Old Testament that this salvation would be available to all was set forth in verses such as Peter's statement to the Sanhedrin in Acts 4.12, and there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. This was the preaching of Paul and Barnabas as they announced that they would go beyond the limits of their own nation and take the gospel to all the world. We read in the account of that fateful day in Antioch, the next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered together to hear the word of God. But when the religionists saw the multitudes, they were filled with jealousy and contradicted what was spoken by Paul and reviled him. And Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly, saying, It was necessary that the word of God should be spoken first to you since you thrust it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we turn unto the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, saying, I have set you to be a light for the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the uttermost parts of the earth. Now it will be in this sense that Paul will say in the 11th chapter of Romans, I ask, have they stumbled so as to fall? By no means. But through their trespass, salvation has come to the Gentiles, so as to make Israel jealous. The careful reader will find many passages in which salvation is set forth in this sense. We can complete our list by quoting the verse which describes the era in which we live today. Christ has come from heaven and has brought us this perfect salvation by dying for us on the cross. And this we can proclaim, yes, this we must proclaim. Working together with him, then, we entreat you not to accept the grace of God in vain. For he says, at the acceptable time, I have listened to you and helped you on the day of salvation. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Rising above this definition, we who are believers are able to know something much more of salvation than that which is set forth as being potential in Christ. We today who believe in Christ, we are able by faith to lay hold on that which has been accomplished for us. And we're able to know that salvation is our present possession. It was of this that Zechariah prophesied at the time of the birth of the forerunner John the Baptist. You, child, will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins. Well, how wonderful it is for us who have trusted in his atoning work to have as a present possession this knowledge of salvation in the forgiveness of our sins. In a world of unrest, confusion, frustration, it is possible for us to have this knowledge of salvation. 
a knowledge that brings in its train all the effectiveness of peace that passeth all understanding. This is a knowledge of salvation which can be our possession without even the slightest doubt about it. This is the force of the double use of the word know in John's blessed statement in the epistle of John. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding to know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God and eternal life. Furthermore, it was the possession of this salvation and the certain knowledge of it which was a great factor in the driving power that sent Paul up and down the world, victim of persecution, in peril from the storms of the elements and the greater storms from the passions of evil men, in order that others might possess this same salvation. Well, this ties in with the fact that the righteousness which comes to the heart through Christ will manifest itself in outward confession. Now, having seen the development and growth of the ideas that are to be found in the word salvation, there remains nothing more than to bring the thought to its climax and fulfillment, namely, that the salvation which we have looked upon in the root, the branch, and the bud, has also a great flowering that is yet to come. In one sense, of course, it is all interrelated, and the possession of any part of it is the guarantee of the possession of it all. Salvation in the future is mentioned throughout the Word of God and includes the sum of all the benefits and blessings which Christians, redeemed from all earthly ills, will enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the consummated and eternal kingdom of God. This definition of salvation I have taken from one of the greatest of the Greek lexicons, there, and I have found no other authority in the field that differs in these definitions. There are passages where the word salvation is used in such a manner that it cannot refer to man's state here and now, nor of the work that Christ has brought to us in the past, nor of the present possession of the believers in Christ at this present time. There are passages and I think that our text is one of them, in which salvation can refer only to the future. And thus we read in a later chapter of Romans, besides this, you know what hour it is, how it is full time now for you to wake from sleep, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Now here clearly is a concept of something that lies in the future and which we shall not know in the life which we are now living on earth. There are other passages which enlarge on the same concept. Paul wrote to the Thessalonian Christians concerning the end of this age and the coming day of the Lord and the judgment which he will bring to the earth. We read in 1 Thessalonians 5, But as to the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need to have anything written to you, for you yourselves know well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. When people say, there is peace and security, then sudden destruction will come upon them as travail comes upon a woman with child, and there will be no escape. But you are not in darkness, brethren, for that day to surprise you like a thief. For you are all sons of light and sons of the day. We are not of the night or of darkness. So then let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober and put on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now note that this salvation is something that is in the future, and it is the thought of all that is included in this future salvation that keeps us separated from the world with our faces turned in the direction of growing holiness. And the passage continues, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we wake or sleep, we might live with him. 
Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. The contrast that is set before men is very definite. You, whoever you are or wherever you are, you are faced with the alternative of future wrath or future salvation. The one who has committed himself to Jesus Christ is ensured of all the benefits that were gained by him when he died on the cross and of all the blessings that flow out from him since it pleased the Father that all fullness should dwell in him and that we should be made complete in him. A third passage in the scripture that speaks of our salvation as lying in the future is to be found in a well-known paragraph in the epistle to the Hebrews. We read in the ninth chapter that Christ has appeared in the past once for all to put away our sins by the sacrifice of himself. He is appearing in the present at the right hand of God as our only mediator and intercessor. But the passage continues, unto them that look for him, he shall appear the second time without sin unto salvation. The Revised Standard Version translates the Greek noun by an English verb, but perhaps makes it a little clearer. Christ, having been offered once to bear the sins of many, will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to save those who are eagerly waiting for him. Phillips reads, Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many, and after that, to those who look for him, he will appear a second time. Not this time to deal with sin, but to bring them to full salvation. Now what does this passage teach us if it is not that the first coming of Christ was God's intervention in the world to deal with the question of sin, while the second coming of Christ will be God's intervention in the world to bring those who have trusted in Christ to the full triumph of his glory. It has been noted 10,000 times that this passage states that Christ has appeared to deliver us from the penalty of sin, that he is now appearing to deliver us from the power of sin, and that he will come again to deliver us from the very presence of sin. Oh, how important it is for us to know that at his first coming, the Lord Jesus met the need of the individual, and that at his second coming, he will deal with the world, with civilization and society, and all that rejected him, that which Thackeray called Vanity Fair. And he will take his own into the completeness of the salvation which he has prepared for them that love him. The important passage in Peter's first epistle, which we treated at the close of our last study, is in this same vein. By God's power, he tells the believers, you are guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. As the outcome of your faith, you obtain the salvation of your souls. We cannot know, we cannot imagine what lies behind these words, a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Then the final verse, which we consider in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, we have the story of the final war in heaven and the casting out of Satan. Many people have been confused upon reading the Bible and have concluded that the devil has already been cast out of heaven because of Christ's prophetic statement, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. Now this, in the light of many other passages, must be seen to be a prophetic past, of which there are so many instances in the Bible. For long after the time of Christ, Satan is still seen in heaven with his malignant forces, the principalities and the powers, opposing the believers in their spiritual warfare. It is against these powers situated in the heavenly places that the believer must wrestle. In the twelfth chapter of the Revelation, the spiritual warfare in heaven is brought to an end. The account of it reads as follows. Now war arose in heaven. 
Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought, but they were defeated and there was no longer any place for them in heaven. And the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent, who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. And I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren has been thrown down, who accuses them day and night before our God. Now note the word, now the salvation of our God has come. This is the salvation for which we wait. In another place in Revelation, the multitude which no man can number cries out with a loud voice, Salvation belongs to God, to our God who sits upon the throne and to the Lamb. This is the salvation for which we wait. With all the prospect of glory in our minds, as we wait for Christ's coming, we must not lose sight of the fact that he himself is greater than his glory. He is more wonderful than his gifts. He is more, far more than the salvation which he has reserved for us. And it is he, the Lord Jesus, whom we delight to confess with our mouth, and we delight that our confession owns him as the Lord and as our own Lord personally. More than any bride ever delighted to acknowledge her husband, do we delight to acknowledge Jesus Christ is Lord. With Thomas we can say, my Lord and my God, and he is the author of that eternal salvation which is ours now. And our God and Father, we pray thee to use these words in the hearts of thy children and in the hearts of others who know thee not to bring men out of darkness and into light we ask it with glory and praise to Thee, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.